Hello and welcome to our first webinar of Optic West. Thank you for joining. I'm just going to take a look. We got a lot of people here uh, that are in the watching us. We got 590 people, and wow, everyone is saying hello, and they're from all over the place, from Brooklyn to Concord, North Carolina, Harrisburg, Maine, bucolic Maine. Okay. All right. So, hey, everybody, thank you for joining. Uh, this is really exciting. Optic West is a absolute dream conference that we've put together. I hope a number of you are going to be in the Monterey region on November 6th and 7th, so you can join us in person. And I hope everyone's been getting all those messages from Eventbrite telling you what's going on and how to make the most of it. Uh, the conference is really shaping up. We're super busy here at B&H Photo. As a matter of fact, I'm here from the offices of B&H Photo on the fifth floor in Midtown Manhattan. And you can see that it is a dreary, foggy day, but a great day to do some work. Uh, we have uh, the amazing Melissa Grew today on behalf of Sony. We want to thank Sony. We want to thank Sony for bringing Melissa Grew here as the first webinar speaker. And also want to thank Sony for coming up with those amazing cameras that shoot 20 frames a second and track birds in flight and do some amazing things because... Back in the old days when I shot some wildlife, I got a lot of soft pictures, but uh, those Sony cameras are amazing. So, Melissa, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, reading over your bio and your information, uh, there's some really uh, cool stuff that I discovered about you. And really, your mission is very much in line with Optic mission of being environmentally conscious, being stoked about photography, and also keeping an eye on conservation. So, it's a, really an honor and a pleasure to have you here. And, you know, I just want to throw out this compliment one more time. Looking at your work in these slides, you are a photographer's photographer. I would be absolutely more than happy anytime to be able to, to capture images like you're getting. Uh, it's pretty incredible. So I'm looking forward to this presentation and also want to give a quick shout out that we have the Sony Creative Space here in New York City. Uh, it's going to be this Thursday and Friday, and it's basically a playground that you can come and check out all the new Sony cameras in really cool settings. And also anyone else who's in the region, you are invited to Thursday night. Uh, b &H Photo is hosting a party at the Sony Creative Space. And uh, Melissa, I hear you're going to be making an appearance. So perfect way for people to say hello to you after this amazing webinar. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you so very much for that introduction, David, and for inviting me here to all of B&H. And I'm, I'm super excited to be a part of Optic West which is, is an incre incredible event with a lot of incredible participants. And I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now and hopefully uh, nothing will go awry as it often does. Um, and we hit play. And let's just kind of launch into it. Um, I, I have been a wildlife photographer for about 12 years now. And it is my, my passion and my joy and my profession. And I want to talk through, first of all, just go through some, some favorite photos that sort of illustrate why I'm just so in love with wildlife and the diversity of wildlife and the feeling that wildlife can, can give us when we're sort of immersed in their world the serenity, the calm, the healing that I find in these spaces is just sublime. Uh, this is a, a snowy egret hunting just before sunrise. I love finding that space like just before sunrise or just after sunset when everything is just sort of softly diffused with light and um, close up of a scarlet macaw uh, in Brazil. And I shoot only wild animals. Um, I don't. I don't shoot anything in captivity except for animals at sanctuaries or at a wildlife rehab hospital that I volunteer at. That's based at Cornell. Uh, these are guira cuckoos photographed in in Pantanal, Brazil. They like to huddle together, I guess, to keep warm and safe. Um, a black-shouldered kite in Tanzania. You know, I I definitely sort of hone my skills on on birds back in 2010 2011 when i first started getting into wildlife photography birds were really what i what i focused on and and in truth they really are the main part of what i photograph but that's i think because you know birds are everywhere that 
that we are. And um, so they're readily accessible. And I think that you can find beauty and grace even among the most common birds. This is a, I call this the owl with kaleidoscope eyes. There's a very special phenomenon with this, this owl's eyes burrowing in, in Florida that I photographed in Cape Coral. Uh, I love black skimmers and they like to get into these sort of feisty fights overhead and sort of capturing moments that illustrate behavior, that illustrate something in the natural history cycle of an animal um, is, a, is of great interest to me. And this is actually a, a buff-breasted sandpiper, just an exquisitely beautiful shorebird. And it's displaying on its breeding grounds in Barrow, Alaska. Actually, it's now called Utkiagavik, Alaska. It's returned to its native name. But I was very, very lucky to see this just glorious, uh, male giving his wing display for females. It's sort of a, a lex situation where females gather and then the male sort of shows off and um, and a female hopefully chooses him for his, his prowess and his beauty. This is a snowy owl female coming into her nest. I did a story for Smithsonian Magazine a couple of years ago and accompanied owl researcher Denver Holt up to Utkiagovic um, to photograph snowy owls at the nest. He's done sort of the longest um, demographic study of this species, about 30 years in, in Utkiagovic. And so that was an incredible honor to work from a blind and photograph a family at a nest. And this female, you can just see her brood patch um, on her belly, which is, is what helps keep her her eggs and then her chicks warm. Um, I did a story for Audubon Magazine a few years ago on, on the American flamingo. And so I traveled to Great Inagua in the Bahamas to photograph these incredible birds. And um, this is a great egret displaying in Florida and uh, a giant ant eater in Brazil. So I, 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 I really do consider myself a wildlife photographer, not just a bird photographer, and I'm I'm especially fond of elusive animals, a lot of them predators. Um, this is a badger that I photographed a couple of months ago in, in Northern California in Point Reyes. And it was really the first time I had a session with this amazing animal from the weasel family that um, just stunningly beautiful and interesting. A roseate spoonbill juvenile from Florida an Atlantic puffin from Maine, American avocet, one of my great loves. This was uh, actually in Montana several years ago um, when I spent deep time photographing this species, which is something I really love to do to immerse myself in the world of a particular species and, and document all kinds of natural behavior. Um, these are spirit bears, which is a white black bear and it's because of a double recessive gene that they're white. And I was exceedingly fortunate to find, um, actually our guides found these bears, a white mom and her white cub um, in the great bear rainforest in British Columbia. And I did a story on them for Smithsonian Magazine as well. This is a wild pony on the beach of Assateague in Maryland. Um, a grizzly in the Great Bear Rainforest, and bobcats near my home feeding on a deer carcass. So, as you can see, I've traveled a lot. I've I've definitely experienced a lot. I've had a lot of really incredible opportunities, and um, and I've really kind of learned that sort of like the more I go along, the more I sort of see how how difficult and complex it can be even given a particular species, to try to come into their lives, to try to do it in such a way that you don't disrupt them, but that you also are able to spend a little time with them to get something unique. And so I wanna talk through some of those challenges that I encounter and, and how I deal with them in terms of gear, in terms of settings, in terms of strategies for approach. And, you know, it's, Wildlife photography is, is a very different genre from like landscape or portrait or macro because, you know, it's not like with landscape where 
it, 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 what you're photographing doesn't move, right? And it's not like people where you can't tell them what to do. And then it's not like macro, at least still life macro, where you can place an object and have it remain there. You have these creatures that are often always moving, are often very quickly seen and then disappear um, and often just kind of burst into action. And so how, how can we be ready for these moments? Um, so there's some significant challenges that wildlife photography poses. And so let's kind of look at some of those. And in the process, hopefully I can, I can help arm you with some tools. So first of all, wildlife is fast and flighty, right? It, it moves very quickly and suddenly and sometimes surprisingly. Uh, this, for instance, is a bobcat I photographed along the Madison River in Yellowstone a few years ago, just suddenly leaped. And this is a um, rock ptarmigan in, in Alaska, uh, flying very swiftly, a rough-legged hawk, one of, one of my favorite birds. Uh, I think that was in Canada. So for me, what I'm always thinking about is shutter speed. That is the king for me when it comes to wildlife photography, especially bird photography. With this exposure triangle we have of aperture, ISO, and shutter speed, that's what I'm always giving priority to. But I don't shoot shutter priority. I shoot in manual mode because I want to have control over all three aspects. Excuse my cat who is meowing. Um, so I want to have absolute control. And uh, I do think people can be very successful using auto ISO and sort of getting that out of the equation. But I like to control my ISO along with the aperture and shutter speed. And with shutter speed, with birds especially, the higher I can go, the better. You know, for a really fast seabird like this tufted puffin, um, I'm going to want to have at least one thirty-two hundredth of a second. And I think that's the error that a lot of people make with birds in flight, especially is not ratcheting up that shutter speed enough. Um, for this, you know, these are some of the fastest waterfowl out there. These are mergansers, common merganser. And I think I was at one thirty-two hundredth for that as well. And so, you know, even if you have to push up your ISO, getting your shutter speed up as high as possible is, is really going to get you the best opportunity for a good sharp shot. Um, and with wildlife, you know, they just move so quickly, especially if they're in hunting mode and they're super still like this reddish egret who is just very slowly moving and, and looking down. And then all of a sudden, like in the most split second, stops the water to capture a fish. And so, you know, even if the bird in front of me or other animal isn't moving swiftly in a particular moment, I still want a fast shutter speed because I want to be ready for that moment when it bursts into action. Um, and when interesting behavior like this, these two snowy egrets having a bit of a tussle over feeding territory in Shinkati National Wildlife Refuge, you know, I want to be ready to capture that. And so I might be at one twenty-five hundredth of a second, um, even if they're just kind of tooling around looking for food, because this could happen at any moment. Um, or this yellow crown night heron capturing a crab. Um, or, you know, the moment that a black skimmer just pierces the, um, the water with their incredible bill, you know, their lower mandible actually senses the fish as they're skimming along, hence the name skimmer. And then their bill snaps shut and then they come up with the fish. I mean, just incredible animals, pardon my cat. Um, so, or this moment with a, a bee eater in Africa. I just have to dispatch my cat for a second. Um, so, what cameras do I use? Um, about a year ago, I switched to Sony. And my main camera, my main love is the Sony Alpha 1. And I also have the Sony Alpha A92, which is kind of my backup. And 
the A1 just kind of has everything that I, I need as a wildlife photographer, you know, it's, it's, it's really sort of top of the line for me. And I think some of the main things about it that I, that just completely excited me was the ability to shoot up to 30 frames per second. Now we don't always need that, you know, and that's a lot of files to deal with, especially at 50, 50 megabytes, 50.1 of a file. But um, when you're trying to capture, you know, just sort of the height of the action, uh, the, the peak action moment, that's going to ensure that you are able to get just the right pose, you know, just that right moment. And most of the time I shoot at 20 frames per second with the camera. And then if there's sort of a flight situation or just some other really key clutch situation where I need to go up to 30, I'll do that. Um, I love the lightness of the camera. It's a lot lighter than my, than my rig I used before. And the, uh, silent shutter for me is, is revolutionary. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, the Sony a nine shoots 20 frames per second, which is, you know, amazing. I think for wildlife, as long as you, you know, even if you're just getting 10 frames per second on the, on the camera that you have, that's fine. Um, but just for my needs, I want to be up at 20 or 30 frames per second. Um, the AF of these cameras is, is for me revolutionary. AF meaning autofocus, I autofocus. And I can set the camera up um, for animal or bird. And it's it's just for me, it's completely amazing how it really is able to lock onto the eye and then stay with the eye so that I can sort of recompose my image. And meanwhile, it's like tracking the eye the whole time. And so it frees me up in terms of with my composition and, and really quite honestly, the most important part of your image as a wildlife photographer, just about all the time is really getting that eye sharp. You know, that's critically important. And I think I struggled with sharpness sometimes with, with gear in the past. Um, and now, now I find that I'm really getting that eye sharp a lot more like at least twice as much. And so that for me is, has really been an, inc of an incredible use. Um, using the silent shutter, to be honest, like this was really my number one thing is um, going to silent shooting because I'm, I so badly don't want to disturb my subject. And it's not just that I care about my subject. I do very much. It's also in my, in my own interest because I can't tell you how many times with my former camera, when I would, it was the DSLR, and when I would push the shutter, you know, it would just sound like a machine gun going off. And like birds and other animals would just be totally freaked out some of the time and would just leave immediately. I could be in a blind, you know, which is a way that I really like to work. And on a tripod, and very still and very quiet. And then all of a sudden I take a picture and the fox or whatever just instantly looks up and it's like, I'm out of here. And for me, that was really, really frustrating. And with a silent shutter, you know, you can be sort of really unobtrusive. You could be camouflaged and the animal still won't know that you're there. You can be shooting from in your house and the bird won't know you're there. So it just opens up a lot of opportunities and really is a way to minimize disruption. And so I'm a big, big fan of that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about, especially for birds in flight, or in particular for birds in flight, have the sun and wind at your back. Like if I'm going out to photograph birds in flight, I won't go if, for instance, the sun is rising from the west and the wind is coming from the east. They both need to be coming from the same direction and from behind me because birds just about always fly into the wind. And so if the bird is facing you and flying into the wind towards you, you also want the light behind you, right? So that's really gonna be your ideal setup. And so that's another thing I really love about wildlife photography is it puts me so in tune with the elements and the weather forecast and the tide charts. And um, that's a really lovely thing about about 
a wildlife, about wildlife photography and, and really figuring out what are the best, what's the best sort of setting? What are the elements of my setting that need to come into place to really ensure that I'm going to get a good shot? And having that sun and wind from behind you, I'm telling you, is is fantastic for, for birds in flight. Um, and you know, even common birds can look so beautiful if you just catch them in the right light and then in some lovely pose like this. This is a ring-billed gull, um, a black tern. And again, here you see that the light is behind, from behind me and the wind is from behind me. So they're flying towards me and they're beautifully illuminated. And that's, that's just absolutely the way to do birds in flight. Um, here's a mallard at my local park. These are American white pelicans that are wrapped in Montana. Another thing I want to say is always be ready. Like this is how I drive around in my car. It's not fancy. It's not an elaborate setup, but I have things at the ready because I never know what I'm going to see. And I shoot a lot, a lot from my car. My A1 is on the top there. It's um, attached to the 600 millimeter F4. Um, usually I have a 1.4 times teleconverter attached. And then I've got the A9 there attached to the Sony 200 to 600 millimeter, which is a fantastic lens. Um, the variable aperture of 5.6 to 6.3. And I've gotten some of my best shots from cars. You know, I call it my mobile blind. And I've really found that birds and other animals are much more comfortable with me in my car than they are with me on foot. And so I really have sort of developed this, this art of shooting from my car and it's, you know, the way that you approach them and the way, and you of course have to stay safe too, right? Because, you know, often it's along a busy street and maybe there's someone behind me and I, I see something. And so I have to go past and then turn around and come back. But I'm also sort of trying to creep up on the animal and, and not let them think I'm a threat. You know, I'll often shoot with a, um, what's it called, a bean bag over the side of the wind. I know B&H offers a lot of those bean bags. And, um, but it's really for me, like this Northern Harrier I photographed near my home. I spotted her just soaring low over the field, hunting for voles. And I quickly pulled over and fortunately there was no one behind me and just lifted my lens out the window, my 600 millimeter. And we just locked eyes and, you know, it was really, really a special moment. Um, you know, or, or like a coyote that you'll just see for like a second and then it takes off, especially around here where they're so persecuted. Um, I just always want to be ready. And so when I leave home or when I'm somewhere traveling and I'm out driving, I don't even start driving my car until my settings are all dialed into my camera bodies. Because the worst thing is if you like suddenly see something really exciting and you grab your camera and then you realize, oh my God, I still have the settings up from yesterday when I was like shooting that bird on a branch and you know, they just could be all wrong. And so you wanna read the light, you wanna get your settings plugged in and really be ready to go. Because so much of the time we only have like 10 seconds, if that, when we see some, some rare animal or some animal that's not used to people and doesn't want anything to do with us understandably. So always be ready. Um, wildlife is unpredictable. It's sort of in line with I've just, what I've just been talking about. But for instance, this was, I had just gotten my uh, A1 and this is down in the swamp near my house, which is the place I love to go. There was these cedar wax wings that were hawking insects. They were flying out over the swamp and, and catching insects on the fly and so I was taking some stills of this of this uh, this bird perched, and then suddenly he took off. Unfortunately, I I had my settings, you know, at a high shutter speed. I was probably at about one twenty five hundredth, and so I was able to capture a sharp shot flying off. Um, same thing with this this owl that was sitting hunting for a long time and then took off in pursuit of prey, and. One of, the, one of the great things you can do with many cameras these days, obviously not, not just Sony's, but 
you have all these customizable buttons. And for instance, as that blue arrow is pointing to, that's a button that I have set up so that it's ready for birds in flight. So I dialed in settings. I think it's at one thirty-two hundredth of a second, ISO 1600 and F5.6 are my settings on that. So that no matter what I'm photographing, if all of a sudden a bird sort of enters my view, enters the scene, I can very quickly with my thumb press that. And as I'm depressing that button, I do have to keep my finger on, but as I'm depressing that button, I'm pressing the, the front shutter. Um, so I'm very, very readily able to change my settings and it's such a great thing to take advantage of. And, uh, I think there's about 16 customizable buttons on, on the A1. It's just tremendous. I'm still kind of learning myself, like just trying to figure out sort of what are the best, what hey, are the best. Hey, Melissa, it's David. Um, we've got a, a ton of, of questions coming in, but oh, I no, want to, I want to jump should... those questions on something. And you said your settings, uh, first off, that's amazing that that camera has the button. You can just switch to that. But the question I have for you is you yeah. said 1600 ISO and do you work with auto ISO or do you recommend staying within a, a static ISO? If you could talk about that. Sure. Um, I do not use auto ISO partly because I'm just kind of a control freak and I, I've learned enough about light at this point that I, I always kind of know given the available light, um, what's the ISO that I can work with. And, but auto ISO can be an amazing tool and I really should start employing it more. Um, and I know a lot of people, pros and amateurs who are using uh, auto ISO to great effect. And for them, it really takes it out of the equation. They don't have to spend any time thinking about it. And I think it can be a, a great tool for people, you know, where you set the upper and lower parameters, like you say, okay, I don't want my ISO to go above uh, 6,400 or 12,800 more, more likely. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's a wonderful tool and a lot of pros that I respect, like use it all the time. So yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a great way to go. Thanks for answering that. I, I've noticed you have a great consistency among your images, and I'd like to talk about photographic style quite a bit. And I think consistency is one of the great ways to to achieve photographic style. And perhaps that uh, that static use of ISO, the uh, you know your pictures don't look like they're they're ten thousand ISO. They don't look like they're four hundred ISO. They look exactly like you wanted them. So kind of bravo on that. Thank you. I mean, there's no doubt I rely on on software, on on tools to help remove noise. Um, you know, I think Topaz Denoise, a lot of people are using that these days and, and finding good success with that. Um, I'm also always, almost always shooting really just wide open. So with my 600 millimeter and the 1.4, I'm shooting it f5.6 and then when i remove the teleconverter i can shoot at f4 but so that's how i'm getting you know those kind of silky uh, mm. out of focus backgrounds and really putting the viewer's attention on the bird or other animal because i'm shooting with such a shallow depth of field um so just, that i think that just yeah. to add to that uh uh, German Bermudez is asking uh, or saying, uh, first off, wonderful, your, your images are great, but how much, if any, editing is in your pics? And, you know, this is, you can just gloss over this one, but but how much of, uh, how much do you, do you actually do a lot of post? I don't do a lot of post, partly just because I don't, I don't have the patience, and I also don't think I'm very adept at it. Um, but I do like to just do the bare minimum. I, I work on exposure. I might do a little bit of dodging and burning, um, sharpening, noise removal, uh, cropping. And, you know, there might be a few times I might clone out something, whether it's like a, a dust spot or that's say there's like a, a twig that's poking in that annoys the heck out of me and that for editorial work or for a photo contest. But just for like social media, um, I have no qualms about that. And, uh, but I really kind of do the, 
the bare minimum. I want to be very quick in and out. And um, so, yeah, I, I, but I think we all have to be good at it. I think we all have to try our best because, you know, it's like Ansel Adams. He spent hours, you know, in the dark room, dodging and burning and, and making his pictures look as good as possible. And I think that's a, a really important part of the process for all of us to just come away with at least a, a basic understanding of editing tools, because it can really make a huge difference in our photos. You know, the contrast, I do often, you know, a contrast a little bit. Um, so, so yeah, I would highly recommend that, that people familiarize themselves with editing software and at least, you know, at least know how to do some, some basic stuff like what I've mentioned. Did you, do you prefer Lightroom or what's your, yes. what's your go-to? Okay. I'm a big Lightroom fan. Gotcha. It's great for me for organizing and I keyword all my photos because I work a lot with editors and they might contact me and say, okay, I need this species, picture of this species and a picture of this species. And I can very quickly look up that species in my catalog, which is now at like 200,000 photos. And, gotcha. um, yeah, but I find in, in, the, in the latest version of Lightroom just has, you know, even more powerful editing tools with masking in particular. I need to, to really sort of practice more, but I used to take stuff into Photoshop when I felt I had to do something a little more involved. Like I really needed to isolate a part of the image um, to work on it. And, and I think we can do most of all that in Lightroom now. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Lightroom. Okay, uh, before you jump back in, I just want a quick shout out. Robert Kaplan says, hi, Melissa. I read your column every month in OP, Outdoor oh. Photographer. Thanks for the inspiration. Thanks, uh, Robert. Thank you, thank you, Robert. I love hearing that. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been my honor to write for Outdoor Photographer Magazine. And um, I've worked for the editor, West now for about six years. And um, he actually created the column and asked me to write it. And, and so if anyone wants to go online, uh, they can access the archive there. And I write a lot about techniques and tools and ethics and all that stuff. So um, let me try to get back on my train of thought. Oh yeah. And so in, in the sense of wildlife being unpredictable, um, it's also unpredictable in the sense of what, what might show up at any one time, particularly if you're in a really wildlife rich, rich area like Tanzania. And this is the lilac breasted roller, which is a, a huge goal for many people when they go to Africa, want to get this bird because it's just so splendidly beautiful. And, um, but you know, any time, any moment you might see a large mammal. And so really the best, well, an essential lens for Africa or a place like Brazil is to have a zoom lens. And my one of choice, I mean, I love the 70 to 200, I have that, but um, for, for wildlife, really my, my zoom lens of choice is the 200 to 600. And, you know, you can shoot at 600 millimeters. You don't have to get the prime lens, which is incredibly expensive, of course. And I know a lot of people can't afford that, but this lens is really affordable. It's tax sharp. And you can quickly go, I think it's just like a two inch zoom ring, like just so quickly go from like 200 to 600 millimeters. And so you can really change your focal length on the fly very, very quickly. So like in Brazil, I might be focused on a rufescent tiger heron. And then all of a sudden there's a jaguar with a caiman or a family of, of giant sea otters. I mean, giant river otters. So um, it's so great to be able to have that versatility. And um, so I'm a big fan of, of, of zoom lenses when you're dealing with, with wildlife, you know, birds and wildlife uh, so that you can quickly move between different lengths. Um, okay, so this is a big challenge. Wild animals see us as predators, right? I mean, pretty much all the time um, we pose a threat, you know, unless you're somewhere like Florida where birds are silly tame, but um, they often just don't want anything to do with us. So how do, how do we cope with that? You know, um, animals want to hide from this. This was a, a baby great horned owl that had just fledged um, in Florida 
and it just was obviously trying to hide from me. So I, I quickly left. I took this shot and I left. Um, or this baby groundhog running away. So what can we do to to try to spend get to spend more time with them? And and sort of what's the best sort of ethical decision in terms of really sensitive wildlife? And for me, long lenses is really key. Um, I shoot with a 600 millimeter primarily uh, and a 1.4 teleconverter, Sony's 1.4 and sometimes the two times the teleconverter. And I do a fair bit of cropping um, because the more space we can give an animal uh, or a bird, really the more comfortable they're gonna be with us. Um, obviously there are exceptions, but um, this is like this little known secret that like the more ethical and careful and sort of empathetic you can be to your subject, the actually the better pictures you're gonna get because that animal isn't gonna flee. You're gonna get more time with the animal. You're gonna see natural behavior. You're gonna be able to capture natural behavior. And so it really behooves you to um, really read the behavior of your subject, you know, really um, retreat if you need to, stand still if you need to. And sometimes you just have to take off if they're really not comfortable with you around. Um, but so yes, I, I rely a lot on teleconverters. And um, and another thing is is really shoot low as much as you can for creatures that are small or for birds that are on the ground or on the water. Um, you're really gonna find that, well, for one thing, you really pose less of a threat than if you're standing up towering over them, especially me because I'm 5'11". And so if you're shooting low, you're less of a threat. You can blend in more. This is, I was shooting the Avocets in Montana here. And you're gonna come out with a photo that really draws us more into the world of the bird or other animal. It's profound how much of a difference it makes. This is a piping plover chick in Massachusetts. And I was lying on the beach and, um, I was working on a skimmer pot. I'll have a picture of that, that in a sec. These are American oyster catchers in Florida. But do you see how the background is just really thrown out of focus? You know, if you're shooting down at wildlife, you're gonna get like all the clutter that's on the ground sort of behind the birds or other animal. And so this way you're just getting, you know, if the background is a good distance away, which is something I'm always looking for, it's just going to be thrown out of out of focus. Um, this is me in South Carolina a few years ago, and um, it's just kind of my favorite place to be is is on the beach shooting low uh, with the skimmer pod, which is like a it's like a frying pan um, with a, a ball head attached. You could put a Wimberley head in there, and it's really great. You just like push it ahead of you on the beach and. Uh, this is a tricolored hair and I photographed in Florida. So this is what it looks like. Um, and uh, I know people make homemade ones, um, but there's ma manufacturers that, that make different ones. They cost usually about a hundred bucks. Um, but like I, I got this photo of piping plover males having a standoff um, on the beach there using that skimmer pod. So here I am out, I think this was Massachusetts. Um, my favorite place to be just on the beach on my own out like that. And, you know, even if you can't lie down, I realize that's not easy for all of us, um, especially the getting up part, but you could sit um, is is better than standing, at least sit and, and you're also less of a threat that way. Um, and if you've got a long lens and if you're a bit of a distance away, you know, that angle sort of becomes less the farther you are away with, with a long lens. So it, it can still look really good. Um, but then a lot of cameras like, like my Sony offer the tilt screen. So what you could do is you could even like, you could put the camera and lens on the pod and not necessarily lie down, but like sit there and tilt the screen up and see what you're shooting. So you don't have to lie down, but you can, it's like, it's as if you were, 
and and get those super low shots. So that's I'm a big fan of that for for the reasons that I think the pictures look better. I think I think that um, that viewers really connect with these images more because you're at the level of the bird, and I feel like it gives the bird or other animal more sort of dignity and more of a presence. And I'm always a fan of that. Wild animals, of course, are often found in remote locations. So how do we how do we deal with this challenge? Um, I definitely do a lot of hiking with my gear and sometimes snowshoeing. Here, this was Hawk Mountain. I did a story for Smithsonian Magazine. Um, this was from my flamingo assignment um, in the Bahamas. Um, a lot of hiking was done to get to the snowy owl nest and out on the tundra in Alaska. Um, these were barred owl babies in a, deep in a forest in, in Ithaca years ago. This is a bristle-thighed curlew, a really special bird up in the hills. Some some of my listeners here may may know about this, the hike you have to take to find this bird um, in Nome, Alaska, and um, the muskox from there. So I I, you know, when there's something that I'm photographing because I'm on assignment or um, I'm gonna be working on a tripod like at an owl nest. I will take the big lens, uh, um, you know, and I, I do hike with that sometimes, but um, these days, now that I have the 200 to 600, I can put it on my hip. I use the spider holster and I just put that um, lens and camera body on my hip and I can just go, go, go. It's, it's light enough so that I'm totally comfortable walking long distances with it. And that's one of the beauties for us with the lighter gear and the new technology developing all the time. You know, we just really have the ability to, to not feel so bogged down by, you know, incredibly heavy gear. And so I, I love just being able to, you know, even like birds in flight, the 200 to 600 is fantastic because it's so light and wieldable. That's a word. You can just very readily, you know, I, I don't like to shoot birds in flight on a tripod. I like to just very quickly be able to move the camera, move the lens and, and being able to do it with this, to me, light lens um, is, is a game changer. So I, I find that really exciting. Um, this was in Yellowstone with a 200 to 600 on the A1 last winter. And um, because I was able to, to hike a bit, got a, a, a lovely session with a trumpeter swan family. Um, another tip I want to point out that I think a lot of people neglect is bring binoculars. Like I see these, these wildlife photographers out there all the time. And yes, you can hold up your huge lens to try to locate the wildlife or see if something's out there, but it's really not ideal. And in binoculars, I find a good pair of binoculars is just a really critical tool for us as wildlife photographers. And not just to locate wildlife, but to really study behavior and figure out if we should move closer or to establish baseline behavior which is something I'm always looking for. Like if there's a sensitive species and I don't want to disrupt what they're doing, um, or I'm going to try my best to minimize disruption because of course, just our mere presence disrupts. Um, I want to study what's sort of naturally happening at a distance without my presence so that when I move in closer with my gear, I can really study any changes in behavior and adjust my own behavior accordingly, if that makes sense. Um, so of course, wild animals have incredible senses and they know that we're there way before we think they do. Um, badgers like this one, as I said, I just photographed recently have an incredible uh, sense of smell. It's second only to the dog family. And so always be thinking about where you are with animals in terms of the wind. You wanna be upwind of them. You don't wanna be downwind. Wait. Does that make sense? You, you, you want the wind to be going away from you towards the animal. And um, that, that's gonna ensure that, that animals like this don't pick up your scent and immediately bolt. Um, 
great horned owls have an incredible sense of hearing. For example, they can, they can hear a mouse stepping on a twig about 75 feet away. Pronghorn have incredible vision. Um, this antelope, whose closest relative is the giraffe, amazingly, and is the second fastest creature on earth. It can actually detect motion four miles away. Um, or you have the golden eagle. This is a, a captive golden eagle from um, rehab in, in Teton um, in Wyoming. Um, they have incredible vision as well and can see their prey from a couple of miles away and their, their main choice of prey being uh, rabbits like this one who cower. Um, so I work a lot from blinds, you know, knowing that their senses are so acute and especially if I'm photographing um, birds or other animals that really the most important part of their life cycle, which is breeding. You know, the time when we really, if we want to capture um, dens or nests, you know, like a fox den or a falcon nest, we, we really ideally are in a blind. And it's not that they don't know that we're in there because a lot of times they will, they'll see us go in there. They'll hear us rustling, even if we're trying to be as quiet as we can be. But they just are a lot more comfortable when they can't see our outline. They can't see us moving about. And they're sort of, they get used to that. They get used to that in the landscape. And often I'll actually put the blind up a few days before I start shooting so that they can just see it as a non-threatening part of the landscape. You, you are going to want a tripod and a chair to sit in because you don't want to just be sitting in there and then stick your lens out when it's time to shoot. And then that ruins everything. You want to start with your lens sticking out on a tripod and still so that when the action begins, you know, you're barely even moving anything. Um, you can also get a body blind like this. I think this is a lens coat. I'm not sure. Um, and that, that can be a really great portable way. You know, it just like wraps up and you can go on a hike and set that up some early morning in the spring when you're like at a warbler rich spot. And it's amazing what, what you can see. And again, you'll need a, a tripod and a seat for this. Um, not necessarily a seat, but a tripod. And uh, full disclosure, I'm an ambassador for Tragopan blinds, which are sort of the highest end photography blinds. You don't have to go high end. You can just get like a $50 hunting blind from your local farm supply store. And it's not going to be as sturdy. It's not going to have all, all the options this, this one gives you. But um, I strongly recommend getting a blind uh, if you're lucky enough to have a yard. Um, it just can be a phenomenal way to capture behavior uh, that you just aren't going to see otherwise. And um, it's, it's how I captured the antics and, and the growing up period of this fox family. Um, a few years ago, which was really a productive time for me. And then of course there's the famous ghillie suit, not my most fashionable moment, but um, it's sort of this 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 outfit that's uh, got applique leaves and stuff and um, allows you to kind of go anywhere. And if you just sit motionless, hopefully you can blend in. I shoot a lot from my car, as I said, sometimes I'll even park at my house and I'll shoot from the car near my house. I know that sounds really odd, but I know exactly the trees that the birds like to hang out in. And if I were to get out of the car, they would all fly away. But somehow when I'm just in my car there, they're going about doing their business and it can be really fruitful. Um, another challenge wildlife presents us is that it's often crepuscular, which means it's more active at dawn and dusk. And this is true for so many creatures that I love to photograph. And uh, like the short-eared owl, which might be my favorite owl species. And here it's captured a vole. And so they, they're really crepuscular and nocturnal. And um, I, I start looking for them at, at dusk in the winter around here, although their numbers are increasingly um, very few. And badgers, of course, are crepuscular. Um, and deer, this is a, a white deer in Seneca. Um, and, you know, many owls are, are crepuscular. And then of course, you know, at, at dawn in the spring, 
and summer um, to have to have songbirds singing, you know, during the dawn chorus is is just such a magical thing. But you really want to get out there um, just before the sun comes up, and and really capture that period of time when birds are starting to get really active. You know, they're really most active in the morning. And so, but what do we need for these low light conditions? We need a camera that has really good ISO capabilities. And so that for me was another selling point of the Sony A1, um, but a lot of cameras offer this now, um, the ability to really shoot at high ISO levels that we really couldn't once upon a time. And so that that really opens up a lot of doors for me. Um, and also the lighter, the more portable your, your camera gear is, the more you're gonna be able to hold it stead steady for slower shutter speeds. Because you know, often you really are shooting at show. Oh boy, that's a tw tongue twister. Excuse me. Um, shooting at slower shutter speeds um, when you're dealing with situations at at, at dawn or at dusk, and um, so that's a that's another beauty of lighter gear. And uh, this is a, a red winged blackbird. This was a, a situation. You know, I've seen other people do this beautifully to capture that. The steam rising as they sing in the spring, as they sing their particular call that I love so much that really, really portends springtime. And, but the conditions all have to be right. You know, the sun has to be behind the bird and it has to be cold enough so that you can see that steam as, as the, the bird um, calls out. And, uh, yeah, and just the way the bird was oriented and, and everything. And I shot this from my car. And it was a project I had one spring and I just went back and back to this particular spot on this road, this quiet road um, where there was a great swamp with lots of blackbirds and finally got my shot. Wild animals care fiercely for their mates and their young, much like us. And so one of the things I love capturing are these intimate moments um, between, for instance, a fox father and his kit, a fox mama and her kit. Here's that same fox dad with his kit. You know, that time when I sat in that blind and photographed that family over weeks, I just had never known that fox fathers were so incredibly devoted. And I was, and maybe that's true of all canids, coyotes and wolves, um, but just to see how, how incredibly caring and devoted and attentive he was, was amazing. Um, American Avocets uh, in, in Montana, just very briefly crossing bills after they mate, which is just an exquisite moment to me. Um, again, you have to be super fast. You know, you wanna have your shutter speed really high for a situation like this. And as you can see, I'm shooting from a very low position. Uh, loving moment between a mated lion and lioness, um, kind of a goofy moment with a, a snowy owl chick yawning under his mom, um, seals in the Galapagos Islands, uh, bat-eared foxes nuzzling each other in Tanzania. You know, and sometimes you get um, moments of, of annoyance and frustration, of course, just like with human dads and moms when their kids annoy them. Um, fox kids love to to tug on their parents' tails. And sometimes they are met with a sharp rebuke from um, their dad. And, uh, or um, this little lion who just wanted to cuddle up with his dad and dad just wanted to nap. And <laughs> it was just a really funny moment um, where I think the cub was sort of regretting being annoying. And then this photo, which is a very special one for me, I was I was sitting outside a, a roped off area in New Jersey, um, looking at, at the least terns that were nesting there and looking for chicks. And uh, they're an endangered species and very special bird to me. And I was working on my tripod with a 600 millimeter lens and a 1.4 teleconverter. And suddenly I became aware of this very odd looking posterior of, of a turn. And doesn't it sort of look like a grumpy fish face? 
that's what, sort of what I, I title it sometimes. But what it is is two chicks, like day old chicks, hiding, hidden under her her feathers. And they're so young that they still have their egg teeth, that tiny white spot on the tips of their beaks, which is this protuberance that many birds have in the egg on the tip of their beak, much like reptiles. And it actually helps them chip out of the egg. And then it falls off after a couple of days after they're out of the egg. So I knew that these were very young and it was sort of this hidden, hidden treasure that I, I was really fortunate to spot and be able to photograph. Um, wildlife's under pressure and at risk more than ever before. What does that mean for us? That's a big challenge and something we need to be really cognizant about um, because it's it's not just gonna get us better pictures, but it's, it's gonna honor our subjects who are each so precious. Um, some of you may have known these figures came out a couple of years ago that we've lost almost 3 billion birds over the last 50 years. This study just came out the other day that we've lost 70% of our wildlife since, since 1970. Um, and, you know, I see since even I started photographing wildlife 12, 12 years ago, there are certain species I don't, I don't see around me anymore, especially grassland species and shorebirds are really getting hit hard. And um, so it sort of becomes more incumbent on us to be very thoughtful when we're in the field and, and also afterwards, after we've taken the photo to be very transparent in our captions um, and to maybe try to use our photos to advocate for our subjects. Um, it doesn't have to be in a really hard hitting way, but educate people a little bit about the animal and social media or however you share your photos and you know, tell them something wonderful, even if it's just one thing, or tell them about a threat that that animal is facing. Um, you know, increasingly, we're all living in cities. By 2050, 70% of the world's population is going to be living in cities and doesn't have any idea about natural history. Um, and so for those of us that are lucky enough to have the opportunity to witness and photograph wildlife, I kind of feel like it's it's how we can give back. Um, a few years ago, uh, working with Audubon and um, bird expert Ken Kaufman, we put together Audubon's Guide to Ethical Bird Photography and Videography, and you can look that up. It's on Audubon's website, and I'm really proud of it. Um, it's a long sort of list of, it's not rules, it's best practices. You know, there's the, long, the, the older I get, the more I realize that there's a lot of shades of gray when it comes to ethics, but there are definitely best practices that really keep the safety and welfare of the bird uppermost in mind. And I, I feel like that's a good resource. I, I hope people check that out. There's also a lot of other articles that we put on there um, that have to do with ethics. And, hey, uh, uh, quick, quick question for you, Melissa, while you're on this topic, I've been waiting for you to get near this because Mike Baines uh, has said, Melissa, you've written often about ethics and wildlife photography. What are your thoughts about using recorded bird calls to attract various birds? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a thorny one for sure. Um, and I, I definitely have my own opinion about it. I think um, I think because of the incredible increase in photographers and bird photographers, the advent of digital photography, the presence of social media and instant messaging, it's very easy for us all to congregate and put pressure on individual birds, especially if they're rare, um, you know, or, or just really special in some way. And, you know, if, if you have one or two people using call playback, you know, maybe, maybe that's okay. Although I, I don't think it's ever okay dur during breeding season. You know, I think during breeding season, when, when a bird needs to be attending to its mate and its nest to draw a bird away to answer your call for the sake of your photo to me um i i can't do it i just don't feel right about it when i was first starting out as a photographer i took a workshop with with a bird photographer who who would place a speaker under the the bird it was springtime and he would find the perfect perch and he would like clamp it onto this branch and then he would put the speaker underneath and he would blast the sound and the bird would come in and, and be very sort of 
alert and looking all about and trying to figure out where is this interloper, where is this competitor, and stridently call, you know, defending its territory. And we got amazing shots. Um, but I actually, I don't use those pictures anymore. And um, I, I can't do that myself. I see the huge challenges that birds have now, and I don't want to add to those stressors. And, um, you know, I do think there's times where it can be really judiciously used by people either for um, necessary bird counts or to turn young people onto birding, um, you know, or you're traveling and your guide uh, is using bird calls to help you see this special endemic bird. But there again, we just always have to be thinking about that we're not the only person doing this. You know, if there are other people, um, do I want to be one more person? Because it's really cumulative for some birds where it really can be a pressure. And um, so personally, I mean, I could talk for a while about this and I would like to devote a column to it for Outdoor Photographer Magazine. Um, for me, it's it's not something that I do and I'm not a party to it. I don't go out with anybody who does it um, when, when I shoot with someone. Um, but I, I do know that some people can use it very judiciously if it's the right situation where it's not a bird that other people are hounding and it's not during breeding season and it's not a bird that's threatened or endangered. Um, so great. that may be more, more yeah. than you want to know, but. Um, no, great, great points. I, I hadn't actually thought of that. And really, I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's, it's intrusive. It's not good. It's not natural. It's that's not, Why do we want to get them to expend energy for our benefit? For what? Another photo we can share on social media? You that, know, to me, it's just like, we have to think about their needs, you know, and their energy expenditure. And um, I don't know, I just I, I just feel like we just have to have empathy. And as I've, I've written and talked about a lot, ethics really come from empathy. And if we can sort of put ourselves in the place of the bird or other animal, um, I think it just will we'll make better decisions. And I'm not perfect. I make mistakes all the time. And um, but I, I do try to operate from a, a place of knowledge about the natural history of a species, about the dangers that species is facing, and about that animal's particular behavior. I do a lot of reading, like Birds of the World, this, this slide I have up. This is a subscription service. You can get it through Cornell Lab Ornithology. And it's, to me, it's like the ultimate bird guide, bird resource, where you can look up any species and read all about their breeding behavior and their plumage and how their young act and all this stuff. And it's such a great resource and you're going to get better pictures that way. Like if you understand your species before you go to the field, I guarantee you, you're going to get better pictures because you're going to be able to predict behavior. You're going to know where to find the bird. You're going to know what habitat it uses or what it eats. What are its signs of alarm? Um, and so you're also going to have your settings dialed in because you're like, oh, I know that this species actually crosses its bill after it mates. And so I know that I want to be ready for that. And I want to not pull my camera away once it stopped mating because it's going to do this really cool behavior right afterwards. So there's so much information available to us online. Now there's no excuse for not reading up at least at a, at a fundamental level. And, and, you know, like all about birds is free part of Cornell Love Ornithology um, where you can look up a particular species and get some really good basic information. Um, so that's sort of a step down from the birds of the world that I just showed you. Lastly, I wanna, I wanna say that I know that I've, I've talked about a lot of exotic places and exotic species, but the beautiful thing about wildlife is that it is all around us. And sometimes the best opportunities are to be found right, right at home or right near home. And some of my favorite shots I've captured out of my windows of my house, even, you know, I use my house as a blind, you know, I'll go up into the bedroom and I'll look at the view and I'll look at the perches and I'll, you know, I do have feeders um, up at my house. And I, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of dissension out there about when is it okay to feed birds or not. And I did actually wrote an article on that for Audubon. Um, you know, I think as 
I think bird feeders are okay as long as we follow best practices, keeping those feeders clean, keeping cats indoors, um, providing appropriate food and um, placing them at a certain distance from the windows. And um, so, so I do attract birds. That's the, that's the one sort of way uh, in my photography life that I, I draw birds closer because I have a lot of great opportunities to photograph them, whether it's from, you know, inside my house or, um, you know, just looking back on, on, out on the feeders and getting the blue jays and, and you want to find a place where they're flying into perch before they visit the feeder. Cause you don't really want to end up with a picture of them on the feeder. Cause that's not so aesthetically pleasing, but birds will just about always come to uh, a tree or bush near the feeder. So make sure you have something like that near your feeder because they like to come in and sort of assess for danger. And that's where you're going to get that shot um, is, is when they momentarily perch before coming in. And, um, you know, even just chickadees are just so darn sweet. This one's all puffed up in the winter. It's cold. And it reminds me of this quote that I love from this writer, John Burroughs, the lure of the distant and the difficult is deceptive. The great opportunity is where you are. And I really feel that's true. You know, I think all of us, even if we live in an urban setting, if you just go to your local park, I don't care if you're just photographing sparrows, starlings, morning doves, you know, if you put time into it, you're going to get special shots. You're going to find beauty. You're going to find interesting little stories unfolding. This is out my bedroom window in the spring when Orioles had just returned. Um, this is an evening grosbeak, and I'm so excited today because a female evening grosbeak showed up at my feeder. Um, it's a really cool bird, and uh, so this was this was out the window one winter. Um, this shows my back deck in wintry time. You know, I have a couple black oil sunflower cylindrical cedars hanging. I also have that platform above because some birds will only come to platform feeders like my cardinals, they'll only come to those feeders and evening grosbeaks will only come to the big platform feeder. Um, I have suet out, I have niger seed for the finches, suet for the woodpeckers. Um, so yeah, if you, if you, if you put out a diversity of food, the best is native plants. I am not, I don't have a brain thumb and I don't really have time to, to have some great garden. And I do hope to have something like that in the future, but, um, planning native is the best thing you can do to attract wildlife to your yard. So this is, this is sort of the second option, but, um, and I'll even put a blind up in my yard you now, as I said, and, um, just leave it up there for weeks and just kind of pop in there when the light's really special and, and put it near a, a tree or a bush where I know they perch or they like the birds like to perch before they come in. And uh, I gotten some, some great stuff that way. Um, like this shot of a, a roseate, I mean, a rose breasted gross beak. Um, and then just a couple of miles from my house was this, uh, Eastern screech owl sunning herself in a tree outside a gas station. And, um, you know, even just morning doves can, can be beautiful, as I said, and have moments of intimacy and, and, and grace and beauty. And, and we can share those photos with other people and try to, to expand other people's appreciation of, of common subjects. Um, this is at a local park. And then this may be my most prize photo. I've traveled quite a bit to see bobcats in the wild. I've photographed them in six different states, but my favorite bobcat photo was captured two miles from my house. Um, and one of the reasons I love this, uh, I was photographing from a car and I was with a long lens teleconverter and I was very careful not to disrupt them. They were coming to this deer carcass and then they would retreat. And the, this is the kits snuggling against mama. For a moment and it was a hard winter and I didn't want to drive them off the food and so I was really quite a distance and then anyone would drive by and I would pull my lens in because I didn't want to attract, attract attention to them because people still trap and kill bobcats quite a bit and uh but to be able to show this moment of intimacy 
and, and to be able to use this photo to try to expand people's understanding of these animals, to see that they have emotions, they have feelings, they have relationships, um, is, was such a gift for me. And, um, and, and also that it happened a couple miles near my house, you know, to know that we have wildlife commonly like this around us, we may not see it very often, um, but that there's this sort of magic in, in our landscapes and these creatures that we live among that we know so little about, but that when we get a, a sight of them, we're, we're really, really privileged and blessed. So, um, that's, that's the last image. And, uh, I just want to say thank you so much, everybody. And thank you to B&H and, and David, and I'm happy to answer, answer the questions. Hey, thank you so much, Melissa. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, boy, the, the chat just lit up with people saying how much they appreciated it. Aww. And to thank you for it. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Really great. Um, you know, there's just a ton of questions, like a gazillion of them. And I I think the, the first thing I want to say is that uh, this has been recorded and you can watch the presentation again, which is really key. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, with all these questions, um, uh, Melissa does teach at Summit uh, Summit Creative Workshops, at Summit Workshops. So I, I'd recommend uh, go to her Instagram and, and follow her, uh, go to the, the website and take a look. And then, yeah, really just jump on. Uh, I think spending some time with you at one of these workshops would be, would be pretty incredible. Um, listen, there's so many questions. I want to just bring this down to one question, mm -hmm. and I'm going to wrap it into really your uh, – your wheelhouse and uh, the a couple of people asked for advice on what would be a step to becoming a professional wildlife photographer, some tips on that. And of course, within the uh, ecological and conservative preview that you that you have, if you could elaborate on that. Sure. Um, I, I, I first want to say that it's, it's very tough to make a living as a wildlife photographer. I just want to throw that out. And I. Um, I'll never forget meeting Mike Nick Nichols, a famous photographer, not geo photographer along the Madison River photographing that bobcat. And I told him this was in like 2012. And I said to him, I wanted to be a professional wildlife photographer. And he just laughed at me. He said, no one makes a living as a wildlife photographer. And I remember feeling kind of depressed about that, but I was like, no, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, I think what really helps us to, di to diversify, I think it's been very helpful that I write, you know, and um, I speak, I teach, I sell prints, I go on assignment, I sell images to editors, um, and, and I am deeply involved in conservation. I'm a fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers, um, and I do feel like that's conservation photography is really is really growing as a genre and as a as a career of sorts. And um, it's not an easy career, but it's an incredibly meaningful one where you really can make a contribution. You don't have to be with the International League of Conservation Photographers to be a conservation photographer, um, but you could certainly get great ideas, and great inspiration from following those fellows on social media because they are storytellers without compare. Um, and so, um, you know, I think just really honing the craft, learning how to tell a story with your photos, um, is super important being able to photograph humans as well as, as animals. I know I showed you nothing to do with, with people today, but, um, increasingly that's what magazines, um, and, and organizations are looking for are stories that tell like Amy Vitali, some of you may know her work. She is the prime example of someone who is really illustrating that interaction between humans and animals and how they can live together. Um, Christina Mittermeier does an amazing job at that. And, you know, there's really nowhere in the world that we as humans aren't impacting wildlife anymore. So being able to tell that story of how the two intersect, have effects on one another is really crucial skill to have. Um, and yeah, just practice as, as much as you can network. You know, a lot of this business is about building relationships. 
um, with editors, with other photographers, with scientists, you know, pitch stories. Don't be afraid to team up with somebody, like whether it's a scientist or journalist, and, and tell a story and go local, work local. You know, that's that's where you're spending all your time. That's those are the stories you're going to really be able to go deeply into rather than some far off jaunt for two weeks somewhere. Find a story, a passion, something you care about close to home, whether it's a habitat or a species, team up with a journalist for a local paper or with an organization that's working to protect or preserve that. And, you know, I, I just think so much can be done locally and, and, um, there's stories all around us. There's, there's wildlife needing help all around us. Find that and dig in. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's a complicated thing and I, I don't have any sort of silver bullet, but, um, as, as I said, uh, really being able to be a conservation photography storyteller. And if you just want to be into wildlife photography, like I think the way most people are making money now, you know, stock, stock photography has kind of died. Um, it's hard to make any money from that anymore, but um, a lot of photographers are just making money now, wildlife photographers from running workshops. Because with this burgeoning interest in wildlife photography, um, you know, there is, there is space for uh, people who want to be leaders and, and teach other people and, and take them to these exotic locales and stuff. Um, but again, that, that feels getting pretty crowded too. So, yeah. Yeah, that's you gave some great tips. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody else in the in the crew does. A um, couple of just notes. Got to say first off that uh, that shot of you in the ghillie suit, the long lines <laughs> holding it. It looks epic. That may be the best hero shot I've ever seen from any. <laughs> it's, <laughs> <crap>. <laughs> it's like the Top Gun of of hero <laughs> shots. You look really cool. <laughs> And uh, and I, I you know a lot of people are saying what your favorite photos are and, and there's a, a bunch of them. I have a little a little chat going here amongst the the people that are supporting this webinar and they're picking out their favorite photos. Um, the bat uh, the bat ear foxes are pretty beautiful. Um, have you ever photographed a wild northeastern black and white chihuahua? <laughs> are you making an offer? No, that's not wild. It's anything but wildlife. But uh, <laughs> but the, the Chihuahua Eisenhower will be at in in, in Monterey at Optic West. So I'll just anyone... probably have my iPhone. Is that okay? That's that's perfect. <laughs> Listen, that that was really great. Um, I you know I want to get you in uh, the next uh, the next in person optic. Try to get you those dates so that you come and visit us in person. I think you're an amazing it. photographer. It's just so much to say. And uh, it's been a, a great, a great webinar. So I want to thank you for for joining us, Melissa. Thank you for Sony, and also want to tell everyone that this uh, was recorded, so it'll be available to watch immediately if you want to rewatch it. Uh, we have another webinar coming up on Thursday, and then one next week, and then we're all heading out to Monterey to give the show. So I saw that there was a, a poll on who's attending in person. We want to tell if anyone is on the fence about attending, it will be 150% worthwhile to come. There's going to be camera giveaways there's contests to enter there's inspiration there's whale watching there's uh photo walks it's uh there's critiques there's just so much going on and we have some of the best speakers in the world and we're honored to be able to have melissa grew here for the first of the webinar pre-series for optic west so again thank you so much for coming and thank joining you. us thank you thank you everyone for watching and and thank you david and B &H. and yeah it's been great yeah. Keep going. Looking forward to meeting you in person. Thanks, you everybody. Too.